Psalm chapter 1. We are going to look at all six verses of Psalm chapter 1. And the title of my message this morning is The Keys to a Blessed Life. The Keys to a Blessed Life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity now to study your word. And we pray, Father God, that as we do, you will show us what blessing is. And you will show us how to be blessed according to your word. Lord, we want more of you, and so we give you place in our lives right now. Speak to us from your word and help us to apply it to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. And all my brothers and sisters in Christ said, amen, amen and amen. Now, with a sermon title like, The Keys to a Blessed Life, it would be easy to assume this is going to be one of your, your self-help seminar types of messages here. But I want to assure you that this is not going to be filled with self-help seminar hype. That said, I think it's important to recognize that there's a deep desire within all of us to live a blessed life. And oh, how the world has all sorts of suggestions as to what constitutes a blessed life. You know, just have money. Lots of it. Just have toys and more of them. Get the latest version always because the other one will become obsolete real quick. No updates. Power, fame. But we also need to see that the Bible has a lot to say about what makes a blessed life. And unfortunately today, there have been many false teachers who have confused many churchgoers about what it means to have a blessed life. Nowadays, and I think it's a terrible commentary, nowadays when you listen to some of these Sunday morning sermons, it's hard to differentiate them from a Madison Avenue advertising campaign, which is appealing to your fleshly sinful nature. Oh, they may take a Bible verse, but they rip it out of context and wrongly apply it to justify you wanting to satisfy your flesh. But during our time together this morning, we're going to get into the Bible, the inspired, inerrant word of God. And we're going to unpackage Psalm chapter 1, because here we will discover the real answers, the true keys to having a blessed life. Let's begin in verse 1 of Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The first psalm, in many ways, I believe, sets the tone for the psalms that follow. In fact, the first verse of the first psalm reveals the first key to a blessed life. And it is this, that God wants to bless his people. And in order for us to be blessed... Be in the world, not of it. Be in the world, not of the world. If you want to have a blessed life, be in it, not of it. Now, throughout the Bible, the Christian will discover comparisons and contrasts. For instance, the Bible makes a distinction, distinguishes between light and darkness, life and death, good and evil blessings, and curses. Well, this psalm reveals an important contrast, what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. 
And I suggest to you this morning that to be in the world but not of the world is the most blessed life of all. In fact, I will go so far as to say it's the happiest life of all. And you might be looking at me and wondering, why would you make such a suggestion? I thought God was a cosmic killjoy who wants to wipe out all our fun. Well, I'll tell you why. Because the beginning of the first verse can be literally translated, Oh, how very, very happy is the man. Oh, how very, very happy is the man. You see, a blessed life is a happy life. And what I want to do right now is unpackage that word blessed. What does the Bible say about blessing? Well, it comes from a word which means to go straight, to go forward, to set right, to advance in the way of understanding. And so it pictures this person who says, I want my life to count. I want my life to make a difference. I've got this object, this goal that I wish to obtain. And so they will not be undeterred. They will not veer to the left or to the right. They are going to go straight, straight ahead, walking in the way of wisdom and understanding. That's what it means to be blessed. Not a life that veers off this way and that way, a roller coaster experience, straight. Straight. The word blessed is also plural. So it pictures a person who's blessed in many ways because of their relationship with God. God has blessed them on multiple levels. So it's like this multi dimensional blessed life. And finally, this person is happy because they're thankful. They know God is. They know God exists, and they know God's always with them, always attentive towards them, always has their best intentions in mind, and is always and every time able to meet their needs every moment of every day. And I think three verses for me, they're my life verses. Summarize it so well in Psalm 73, verse 25, 26, and 28. This idea of being thankful, grateful, blessed on multiple levels. Whom have I in heaven but you? And beside you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. As for me, the nearness of my God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. There it is. When you know who God is and the value of his presence in your life, it changes everything. That, my friends, is a blessed life. Now, the first key to happiness begins for us under the new covenant, inaugurated through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross as a substitute, a sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins. It begins by asking Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sin. If we don't, we stand condemned, unforgiven, worthy of judgment, waiting for judgment to fall. We need him to be the savior of our souls. Why? Because he's saving us from condemnation. Psalm 32 verse 1 says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Oh, what a blessing that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? But at this point, there might be some here or online wondering, Why Jesus only? You know, in in our day and age, that just sounds a little bit too exclusive. That might be your truth. Have you heard people say that before? That's your truth? Because everything's relative? That's not my truth? I, I just thought all paths lead to heaven and to God anyway. 
right? Well, those are fair questions, and I don't want to mock or minimize that for a second. Those are fair questions, and it's important for us to understand that the Bible does have something to say in answer to those questions. You see, in one sense, you're right. All paths do lead to God because all will stand before God someday in judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. So it's true. All paths do lead to God because all will stand before God someday. But here's the question. What will your standing be with God when you stand before God? The Bible says that your standing with God is determined by your answer to this question. Who do you say Jesus is? I suggest it's the most consequential question of all. Because your answer to that question will determine eternity. It's the most consequential. And everyone, by the way, no one gets out on this one. Everyone must answer it. And Jesus Christ revealed why. Our answer to this question is so consequential when he said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So here's what the Bible says, that if you're here today and you believe that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for your sin and you asked him to be your Savior, You see, it's not just enough to say, well, I believe he was a good person or a good teacher. No, you've personally prayed and asked him to forgive you of your sin and to be the savior of your soul. Then when you stand before God someday, you stand forgiven. And he will welcome you into eternity to be with him forevermore. But... If you do not believe Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for your sin and you have not asked him to be your savior, then when you stand before God, you stand unforgiven and he will not welcome you to spend eternity with him because Jesus Christ is the only way our sins are to be forgiven so that we may spend eternity with God. But but please know this. God wants a relationship with you. But the truth is, our sin has created a barrier between us and God. And so God has provided the one way for that barrier to be removed, and it's through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why the Apostle Peter said in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I am so blessed, and I'm sure you are as well, that there's no confusion. There's just one way. Jesus Christ, amen? Just one way. Therefore, the first key to happiness, to be in the world but not of the world, begins with receiving the gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Because the truth is, without faith in Jesus, you're going to be in the world, but you're still going to be of the world. He's the only one who makes it possible for us to be in the world, but not of it. And not only does the blessed life begin with Jesus, as we work through this psalm, we'll see that all our future choices must flow from our relationship with Jesus. What I mean this, what I mean is this, a blessed life is a holy life. Yes, it's a happy life, but it's also a holy life. And I want to, in verse one, show you this progression. We're going to break it down into parts, three parts. First, a blessed person does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. A blessed person does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. These words does not means it's a decisive choice. It's a resolution of one's will. I think that old Christian spiritual captures it so well. I have decided to follow Jesus. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. My sermon's done now. Isn't that it right there? It's that decisive choice. Captures it so well. What are we choosing not to do? We're choosing not to walk with the wicked. Why? Because to walk means to go along with, to follow the way of life. And we need to understand if we go the way of the wicked, if we walk with them, it's the first step towards greater compromise. That first step is a step towards compromise. The word counsel there means to purpose, plan. It's a way of thinking. It refers to an attitude, a state of mind, a viewpoint, which determines the decisions that a person makes. And the wicked refers to someone who's guided or controlled by their fleshly desires, emotions, or impulses. This is an unstable person. This is a morally loose person. Oh, sure, they're not as evil as they could be all the time, but they're superficial. They're materialistic. They only see the here, the now, and how to be satisfied in the moment. They're unconcerned about the consequences of their choices. I'm reminded of Esau in Genesis 25. He comes in from hunting, he's hungry. His younger twin brother, Jacob, cooked up some lentil stew. Esau comes in and says, give me a swallow of that red stuff. And Jacob says, first, sell me your birthright. Esau says, what good is my birthright? Which means a double inheritance when his dad dies and he becomes the priest and the judge of the family after dad dies. What good is my birthright if I'm dead? Total exaggeration. Jacob understood the value of the birthright. He says, first swear it. So he swears it, swallows the red stew, wipes his mouth, walks away, no regard for the birthright. I think that captures it perfectly, that idea of the wicked living for the now, not seeing the consequences of their choices. In today's terms, what does this counsel look like? Perhaps you've heard the advertising slogan, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Really? Does it work that way? Or how about this one? It's okay to look as long as you don't touch. Really? Really? Don't you know what enters into a person is the first step towards greater compromise? I think Peter's counsel is so much better. He says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 18, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Oh, there it is. Set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. Say to the Lord, you died on the cross for me. Now you're captain of my life. I welcome you to have authority over every area of my life. I open wide every closet. I want you to clean house, Lord. I set apart myself every moment of every day. I want you to be Lord of my life. Why? Peter continues, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he may bring us to God. There's the goal. You see, when God is working in our lives right now to have a holy life, He's preparing us for an eternity with Christ. He's making us look more like Jesus. And I welcome that. Sanctify Christ as Lord of your life. Second, a blessed person does not stand in the path of sinners. So he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor does he stand in the path of sinners. Stand, the word here means to stop, to be firm. So notice the progression from merely walking in their counsel one becomes more confirmed, more involved, and influenced by their counsel. The word path means a way, a journey, a course of action. It refers to one's conduct that leads to patterns, that leads to habits and responses. So this, this person now is moving from thinking like the world to acting like the world. 
And the word sinners is an archery term and not a complimentary one. It means that you're not a good archer because you always fall short. You miss the mark and you're even aiming at the wrong target. You're not going to win the Olympics with that one. And Jesus explained why it's unwise to walk in the counsel of the wicked and stand in the path of sinners when he said in Matthew 15, verse 14, if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Third, a blessed person does not sit in the seat of scoffers. Again, notice this. There's a progression. We've gone from walking to standing, and now you're sitting, which signifies you're at home. You're at home in this lifestyle. The seat here is a place of assembly where counsel is given, where decisions and deals are made. Usually it'd be at the city gate. And scoffers are those who mock, deride, ridicule, and scoff. And specifically, it refers to those who are actively engaged in putting down the truth about God and his word. Well, in today's context, what does a scoffer sound like? A scoffer sounds like, and there's many that I could choose from, but I pick one. New atheist, Richard Dawkins. Now, back in the day, they just called them atheists. I don't believe in God. Now they call them new atheists because these new atheists attack anyone who does believe in God. And you'll see what I mean by that. When you listen to what I read from Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion, and I quote, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, felicital, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. You know, the Bible has a word for those who deny that God exists. Psalm 14 verse 1 says, the fool... The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The Bible has an answer. And the Bible also reveals, as we see the, the rise and the presence of more scoffers and mockers, it's another confirmation that we're in the last days. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 4, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And you know, when I, I reflect on Psalm 1, I'm reminded of two characters in the Bible, one from the Old Testament, one from the New. Old Testament, Lot, Abraham's nephew, we're told in Genesis 13 that Abraham and Lot, their flocks became so prosperous, so abundant that they had to part ways. So Lot chose east towards the Jordan River, this beautiful, fruitful plain. Oh, by the way, there were two cities there. Perhaps you know them, Sodom and Gomorrah. They had a reputation. The men were exceedingly wicked there, but Lot thought no bother. My flock will be fed, and that's all that matters. So we're told in Genesis 13, they parted ways, and Lot cozied up to Sodom and pitched his tents there. But then you come to Genesis 14, one chapter later, and we're told that now it wasn't good enough to pitch your tents next to Sodom. He moved into Sodom. And then you come to Genesis 19, where God has made it known to Abraham that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Sends two angels. And where do they find Lot? At the city gate in the evening as a judge. So he's gone from living near to living in, and now he's one of them. How do you know that he's become one of them? Because when the angel said, find anyone you can and tell them to get out, get out. Because destruction's coming. He goes to his two future sons-in-laws engaged to his daughters. And he says to them, 
Get out. Judgment from God's coming. And what do they say in response? You're kidding. You're kidding. It's also confirmed by Lot's wife. You remember what happened to her when they fled the city. Why is it that she turned around, even though she was commanded not to do so? The judgment would come upon her if she did. Longing in her heart. You see, they didn't influence Sodom. Sodom influenced them. Progression. Demas in the New Testament. You may be wondering, well, who's Demas? I've never heard of Demas before. Well, he's revealed in three of Paul the Apostle's letters. And I want you to see the progression here in these letters because I think you see a tragic progression in his life. In Philemon, verse 23 and 24, notice how Demas is described. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. Look at this. As do Mark, the writer of the gospel, and Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, the writer of the gospel, Luke, and Acts. My fellow workers. Wow. Now, Demas is in some good company there. And to have Paul say, my fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't know when it shifted, but then we see a pivot in Colossians 4.14. Again, Paul sends his greetings. He says, Luke, the beloved physician, glowing word, sends you his greetings. And also, Demas. Demas. No fellow worker there, just Demas. And then you come to 2 Timothy 4.10. Paul writes his last letter to his son in the faith. He's in prison, ready to be executed by the emperor Nero. And notice what he says about Demas. Having loved this present world, he's deserted me. But I needed him most. And he's gone to Thessalonica. Now he loves the world. Fellow worker to lover of the world. Here's my point. Our lives are all progressing towards a target. And the question is, what target are you and I aiming at? You see, the wicked and the sinners and the scoffers are all aiming at the wrong target. Look again at verses 4 through 6 in Psalm 1. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Here's my point. Now more than ever, we must not let the wicked, the sinners, and the scoffers influence us. We must influence them. Brothers and sisters, we're the only ones that have a message that transforms lives. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Our world needs what we have. We must be in the world, but not of it. Or as Warren Worsby said, we must have contact with the world, but not be contaminated by it. How? How? It begins with, I suggest, the Bible. And I want to show you from this psalm, the remainder of our time together, what it means to live in God's word. We must live in God's word. If you want to have a blessed life, live in God's word. And I, I'm here to tell you, I am so grateful that we have a pastor who is committed to teaching us through the entire counsel of God's word. He is a rare gem. Yes, let's give thanks to the Lord for him. Absolutely. He is a rare gem today. Many pastors will settle for the easy. Go towards those passages which are easy. Hand out these little sermonettes to make Christianettes. If you get what I mean. They just gravitate towards those topics that are easy and palatable. But you know what? He's going through the entire, he taught us through Leviticus. Some pastors will avoid that like the plague. We're blessed. But if your only exposure to the Bible is when you hear Pastor Rich teach, 
and you're starving. And that's no criticism of his teaching. You see, God wants you and I to be in the word for ourselves. There are treasures that he wants to reveal to you personally. And the only way that you'll discover them is if you live in God's word. What I want to do now is look at verses two and three and unpackage it. First, we see that we need to delight in the counsel from God's word. Delight is a key word there. It means to be mindful of, attentive to, and so it came to mean to keep or to protect. Now, when something delights us, isn't it true we desire to protect it or guard it? Husbands, we protect our wives. Why? Because we delight in them. We desire to protect and guard them. We moms and dads love our children, so we desire to protect and guard them. Isn't that the case? We love our cell phones, so we put a protective case over them, right? (laughs) Because we want to protect them. We treasure it. And you know what? I found that the word of God is one of the greatest treasures of all. And when you read God's word, it brings joy because we need to know God and his plan for our lives. Our world is filled with a lot of noise and the word of God is true signal. When you read the word of God, it becomes your delight. You're going to have a testimony like we see in Psalm 119 verses 14 through 16. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. As much as in all riches, I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. Question, how do you know what you delight in? Simply ask yourself this question. What has captured my heart? Truthfully answer that question. What has captured my heart? And I suggest this. The one who's only worthy of capturing our heart is God. And we need to delight ourselves in him. Amen. Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now this is one of those verses that's been wrongly interpreted. Some have interpreted it to mean... If you delight yourself in God, then he'll give you whatever you want. Hey, if you've got a Dodge in the garage, you're going to get a Maserati, okay? He'll give you whatever you want. Just delight yourself in him. Pat him on the back. I love you, God. Now give me that car. That's not what this verse means. Here's what it means. It means this. When you delight yourself in God, what happens? He changes our desires and we desire more of him and he gives and he gives and he gives again. That's what you see in Psalm 73, which is what I mentioned earlier. He gives us more of himself. And oh, by the way, what we delight in is also reflected in how we spend our time. And I suggest the Bible tells us that we need to meditate on the counsel from God's word. We more than ever need to meditate on the counsel from God's word. Now, This word meditation, we need to clarify what that means because there's biblical meditation and there's Eastern meditation and the two are not the same. With Eastern meditation, you contort your body into these positions which may require a physician later on to help get you out, okay? And then you recant or you can't this this word over and over again. You know what that word is? Om. There's a lot of intelligence in that word. Om, right? And you just say it over and over again. The whole goal is to empty your mind so you can become one with the cosmic universe. And I'm thinking, you know what? This is pretty empty anyway. I don't need to help it any further, okay? And so that's Eastern meditation. Biblical meditation is when you fill your mind. I fill my mind with the precepts, the principles, and the promises from God and his word. And Paul captures it in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, when he says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. The psalmist continues. He says, day and night, we need to be in the word. Now, this does not refer to morning and evening Bible study. Rather, 
And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. But rather, it's a reference to a life that's continually and consistently in God's word. It's a comprehensive term for the study and application of God's word to one's life. So someone reads the Bible, and as they live their day, they are intentionally looking for ways to apply God's word to whatever situation they encounter, a relationship, a choice. They are making a decision to live intentionally by God's word. Psalm 119, verses 97 through 99 Here we see what happens to a heart that lives this way. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation day and night. Now, what are some practical ways for increasing the amount of real estate we give to God's word in our lives. I like to suggest a couple of things that have worked for me over the years. Number one, reading through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, I'm doing that right now. I have the YouVersion app, so here's what I do. I read it and I listen to it at the same time because here's here's something I've learned. If I just read and I don't listen, then I tend to fall asleep because I go brain dead real quick. Anyone else? So it keeps me alert. It engages me with my ears, my hearing, and visually as well. It keeps me focused and engaged. And that has been a a great, great help to me. So I'll read through the Bible like that. And I'll just study and then I'll pray about it. You can also memorize scripture verses. Very, very powerful to take verses and memorize them. Oh, how I've seen how God uses those Bible verses to minister in different parts of my life. The other thing I want to focus on, though, is repetitive reading. Maybe you've heard of it before. I was introduced to repetitive reading when I was going to Multnomah Seminary back in the 90s during a Bible study methods course. What is repetitive reading? Well, for that class, I was required to read the book of Ephesians 50 times. So six chapters, I got to read all six chapters. That's one time. I did that 50 times. And you know what? It had a powerful impact on me. I'm teaching the women right now on Tuesdays, the book of Ephesians, and everything I read, there it is right there, all those years later. You see, they might be able to take the Bible away from me someday, but they can't take what's been treasured in my heart. Well, I saw repetitive reading, the power of it. I saw the impact it could have when I was living in Dallas, Texas. I started a church. I was going to Dallas Theological Seminary. And I was introduced to this man named Jim Rutledge. He started a ministry called Next Step Ministries. One day we sat down for lunch and he was telling me his testimony. Our church was considering supporting their ministry. And he told me that he had gone to church for years with his wife and their kids. And they kind of developed this this identity because he had dark hair, handsome guy. She's blonde, beautiful. They were the Ken and Barbie at the church. That was their reputation. On the outside, they looked like everything was perfect. He said that is until they got in the car after church, and then they fought like cats and dogs all the way home. Their marriage was in shambles. Their family was falling apart. And the nature of his business, very lucrative businessman, he had to travel all the time. And that didn't help his addictions. When you don't have accountability... He told me this, it wasn't a matter of if I fell, it was a matter of when I fell. So he knew he was in trouble. He needed some help. So he started doing some of those 12-step programs, and, and he found them helpful to a degree, but his marriage was still falling apart. So finally, he confides in a, a member of the church and says, I don't know what to do. I think everything is going to be just lost here if something doesn't change. And his friend says, why don't you do repetitive reading? I want you to, for the next 30 days, read the book of Philippians, all four chapters. All four chapters every day. And so he did. He struggled with reading, so he had actually read it out loud as he's walking around the room. He'd read all four chapters to keep his mind engaged. Well, somewhere along the lines, his wife, he says, he knew there was a change. When his wife came downstairs to talk with him, She was going to the store and she says, hey, Jim, I'm going to the store. You need anything. Now, in the past, he would have a snarky response. 
pop off and say something. He was about to do so, and all of a sudden, the book of Philippians comes on his grid. And then there's Philippians chapter 2. Have this attitude in you, which is in Christ Jesus. It checked him, and all of a sudden, out of his mouth comes kind words. His wife looks at him like, who are you? She's bracing herself for a snarky response. And he's looking at himself like, what is happening to me? And he realized it's the word of God. The power of God's word through the power of the Holy Spirit was transforming his life. And it changed the way he spoke to his wife and brought healing to their marriage. Well, then he started thinking about all those people that he knew who were addicts in the 12-step program. And he started Next Step Ministries, the next step after the 12 step, getting people in the word of God. So he invited me to their house for a Bible study, and it was packed with all these addicts who are reading the Bible repetitively and their lives were being changed. It is God's will for us to know God's word. And he wants to change our lives through it. Amen. Beautiful testimony. Now, if you're a new Christian, new to the faith, I recommend reading the Gospel of John to learn more about Jesus. And then afterwards, 1 John, the letter of 1 John, so you can learn about how to apply it to your lives. Next question, how should we approach studying the Bible? Four recommendations. First, always prayerfully. I don't read the Bible until I pray first. Lord, I want you to open my eyes. Help me to understand how to apply it to my life. Number two, expectantly. I'm asking God, you know my needs even before I do. You're in my tomorrows. I pray expectantly asking God to meet my needs according to his will, his time frame. Humbly, number three, I submit to God's authority. Oh, I don't place my authority over God's word. I want the word of God to have authority over my life. And number four, contemplatively, I want to throughout the day digest God's word. And what I've discovered is this, that God will bless you through his word. God will bless you through his word. Notice here, a tree is a picture of what? When you think of a tree, I think of stability. And that's what's being communicated here. It has the capacity to withstand the storms of life. And so those who are grounded in the word of God, they will have, it pictures this idea of a mental, emotional, and spiritual stability in every season of life. And a tree also grows, and so it's a picture of growth. The word planted there means to transplant, to cause to take root, to become from, uh, firmly established for the purpose of stability, nutrition, growth, and eventually production. And when I think of Psalm 1, I'm reminded of the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 7. When he talked about the importance of applying his words to your life, and he said in verses 24 and 25, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Oh, build your life on the word of God. Build your life on the teachings of Jesus Christ. And when the wind and the waves of life blow against you, you will not be shaken because Christ is our strength. By streams of living water. This tree is planted by these streams of living water, which is symbolic of what? That those who are in God's word are continually refreshed by the Holy Spirit. And oh, how we need the Holy Spirit to refresh us. Amen. Daily. You, you know what? For me, I've realized there's this importance. It's not just that the Bible is important to read. It's like air and water. I can't survive without the word of God. There won't be more real estate in your life for God's word until you cross that bridge from importance to it being absolutely essential. We need the refreshing of the Holy Spirit through God's word. I remember one of my favorite professors at Dallas Theological Seminary, Dr. Lanier Burns, head of the systematic theology department. Love this guy. 
He has such a passion for life. He would teach all these seminarians and then during lunch, share his lunch with the homeless people in downtown Dallas, then come back and keep teaching. And when he taught, he would just kind of lean into it like this. He grabbed the pulpit like that. He's talking about theology proper and soteriology and the end times. And you could just see he's going after with all that he has. I love the brother. He shared with the, us one time, though, that there was a real difficult semester at DTS. And he comes home after the semester, and his wife looks at him and says, Lanier, you haven't been in the Word. He's like, I'm a Bible teacher. What are you talking about? This is what I do for a living. Of course I'm in the Word. She goes, no, you haven't. You haven't been in it for yourself. Your eyes are cloudy. So he took it to heart. That very moment, went and got away, prayed, read God's word. A few hours later, he sees his wife again. She says, Lanier, you've been in God's word. How do you know? Your eyes are clear. Your eyes are clear. We need to be refreshed, and God promises to do so through his word. Also, we see here it yields its fruit in its season, meaning its fruit is ripe, You know as well as I, in order for fruit to grow, it needs to abide in the branch and the vine. Jesus invites us to abide in him, abide in me, John 15, verses 4 and 5, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Next, we see its leaf doesn't wither, which speaks of vitality. Even as the leaf gets older, which personally, I find very comforting and appealing the older I get. You see, we may be getting older, but there's a radiance that shines through a life that's filled with the Holy Spirit and is maturing in Christ. In Christ, we are going from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 4.16, Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. And lastly, in whatever he does, he prospers. Because he's renounced worldly things, delighted himself in God's word, And therefore, God will bless his life in accordance with God's word. As I close, it's interesting. After every service, I've talked to people who can understand what I'm talking about next. You see, I'm talking about getting in God's word. And yet I know in a group this size with people online, there might be some who say, you know what? I love the idea. I've tried it before, but I struggle with reading. It was an epic fail every time. New Year's resolution. I'm going to go through the Bible this year, and I'm out by Genesis 15. And I get it. Because when I was a little boy, I had reading comprehension issues. Held back. My sister, she's younger than me. She was put ahead of me in school, and I was put backwards. I I was the kind of kid, and maybe you can relate to this, I hated it whenever the teacher would call on someone to read in class. Anyone else? Oh, my word. I was trying to duck under that desk as low as I could go because the last thing I wanted was to embarrass myself by reading out loud in front of everybody. I get it. But... There came a point in my life, and I'll never forget it. I was going to a four-square church, New Life Center, Everett, Washington. Pastor Tom Ferguson was there. He's now gone home to be with the Lord. Wonderful pastor. And he was given a message about the importance of God's word. And I remember sitting up in the balcony off to the side, And he's giving a message about the importance of God's word. And I knew in my spirit, it's like, I need to be in God's word. I'm making decisions that are going to have a lasting impact. I need to make the right decisions. I need God's word to have more real estate in my life. And so he said, I'm going to pray for anyone who wants to have God's word to have a greater presence in their life. So I'm in the back, up in the balcony. I'm raising both hands. Give me a double portion, Lord. 
and I can't explain it, but I will tell you this. That day I went home and I tried it out and I opened up the Bible and God began to rewire my mind as I read it. And I began to understand it in a way that I never understood it before. And I say that because I don't want anyone who feels discouraged to remain discouraged. Who made your mouth? God. Who made our minds? God. God wants to help us because God wants us to know his word. God wants you and all of us to have a testimony. The testimony we see in Psalm 119, verse 11 and 105. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you want God's word to have more real estate in your life, if you struggle with reading, will you join me as I pray? And ask the Lord to meet us here. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you've shown us the way to a blessed life. What we are to avoid, but also what we are to embrace. And we want more of you and more of your word. And so, Lord, we pray, give us a greater appetite for your word. And I also want to pray for those who struggle with reading. That just as you met me and helped me. That I of all things could even complete a doctorate to you be the glory. It's a testimony of what you can do when we pray and seek your face. We thank you that your word says that if we pray according to your will, you hear us and we have whatever we ask. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray together. Give us an appetite for your word and help us to read it, digest it. And live it, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of my brothers and sisters in Christ said, Amen. Amen. Can we give thanks to our Lord?